Uh, good morning, members. It's uh, 30 years since I last chaired a council meeting in these historic chambers in the good old days when the Liberals were in charge of Andale and Estale District Council and I was the vice convener. So times have changed, but uh, we're here to do the business of Annandale and Estale Area Committee, which is being live streamed and recorded. The recording will be made available on the council website for public listening. Report participants, please follow the good practice guidance, muting microphones, switching off your video, writing speak in the Teams chat function when you want to contribute. If you're in the hall, you can do this on your iPhone or iPad. Please don't repeat contributions already made by other members. No material should be posted in the chat function if it is intended as part of the discussion. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by roll call. If any member has to leave the meeting, please either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time or write leave in the Teams chat function and then join when you, when you rejoin the meeting so we can keep track on whether the meeting is correct. All members should speak clearly and directly into the microphone when making contributions and referring to the reports, please provide reference to the relevant page and paragraphs to allow everyone to follow. Please focus contributions on areas where clarification is required or to propose an alternative to a recommendation. We have the sederant bodies and chair's approval of members' remote participation. Tracy, can you provide this sederant? I confirm my agreement to the participation of the members named as participating remotely. Two declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest? None. Okay, three is a minute of the previous meeting of the 20th of September 2022. Are we happy to approve the minute? Uh, thanks, Chair. It was just on page 11 in the minute, um, under item 7, the use of land at Moffat Sports Barn, um, where there was a, it, we noted uh, and agreed a number of things uh, in relation to that, but um, subsequent to that meeting, it was determined that the land was in fact common good. Um, so it was just really to, to air that at this meeting. Um, I know it doesn't actually f mention one way or the other whether it's common good, but I think on the day, I think we'd taken the decision based on the fact that it wasn't common good on the advice we'd received, but subsequently turned out it was. So it was just to record that. Thank you. So if we can, if we can note that, please. Thank you. Otherwise, happy? Yep. Yeah. Uh, four is the health and social care performance management reporting for area committee business meetings. And there's a report by the head of social work, chief social work, work officer. So our first, this is, this is the health and social care report over you. The report highlights that people accessing services post pandemic seem to be frail than th those accessing pre pandemic. And whilst that is perhaps something we all thought of, of uh, or expected, it is nonetheless extremely concerning. The logistical challenges of delivering the COVID-19 vaccination program are highlighted and I think a region should be commended for its level of uptake being higher than the Scottish average. Gary Sheehan and Caroline Ronaldson are on teams to answer any members questions or address any members comments. Gary and Caroline, before I open to members questions, I'm aware that the new Anne Health Centre opened in May 2021 and the vaccination clinic has more recently moved from Charles Street in Annan up to the Sonas building on the Annan Hospital Estate. Could you provide an update to members on where the team previously located at Sonas are now based and how members and others may get in touch 
with community link waters. Hey, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the, the members of the SONAS team uh, have now moved out of the old SONAS building, which is now being used for the vaccination service. And they are now uh, using hot desk and facilities out of the, the Howgill Centre. So they are contactable uh, from there. During COVID, uh, a lot of our staff, particularly within the SONAS team, uh, were working remotely, working from home and in the community. Uh, and, and now sort of they haven't got the access to the same amount of space as they previously had in SONAS, uh, but they do have hot desk and facilities within the Howgill Centre. The thing I should add as well is that as part of the introduction of home teams, members of the SONAS team who traditionally you know, worked across the locality uh, as part of one sort of you know, uh, locality team, uh, through the introduction of home teams, we've now got two home teams for one for Upper Annandale and one for Lower Annandale. So what we are working towards is a situation whereby staff who previously were uh, office based in Annan, uh, that the that the plan is that they will have hot desk facilities uh, in in Upper Annandale as well, probably in the Lockerbie office uh, or within uh, Moffa Hospital. But in the short term, SONAS are contactable and their sort of main office base is now within the Howgill Centre. Uh, th thanks, Gary. Uh, any members, got any questions or comments? Councillor Thompson. Thanks again, Chair. It was just uh, on reading the report, uh, obviously you provided a locality manager's report, which sets a bit of context. Um, and I think it was, you maybe touched on it there, but around um, the use of cottage or community hospitals, obviously there's been a bit of interest across the region in terms of um, what, uh, how, how they're best deployed. But um, I understand that um, from the Chief Operating Officer of the Health and Social Care Partnership, at least, um, that more people are able to be seen to at home with the current staffing arrangements just because of various pressures than would be if all the cottage ho hospitals were open because it would actually put a limit on uh, how many people could be looked after given the staffing arrangements that would be required. I'm just wondering if you could maybe speak to that in terms of an Annandale and Estill context. Um, that would be helpful to members here, I think. Thank you through yourself, Chair. Okay, we'll probably respond to that. Uh, in terms of, we are about to relaunch a, uh, a review of our community bed base uh, across the whole of Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and our definition of a community bed base uh, will be looking at the role of our community hospitals, our care homes, and the developments of our housing with care and support services. Uh, so that uh, work on that is, is now beginning uh, and will be completed. Uh, and there will be a full engagement process uh, beginning in the new year with the, the wider community, uh, bringing it sort of, uh, um, the, the, the bit I would sort of also add uh, in response to your early question about we have redeployed staff who previously worked in what are the, currently the suspended community hospitals. And one example of that more locally is Moffa Hospital. Those staff are, have been redeployed to work into the community and they are supporting more people in the community. That They've also contributed towards the vaccination programme. Uh, the, 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 the very high level message you give at this stage is that we conduct regular day of care audits uh, which review you know the appropriateness of people being uh, living within our community hospitals and the most recent day of care audit confirmed that 70 percent of the people in our open uh, community hospitals don't meet the criteria uh, to remain resident within the community hospital. Uh, and the, the moving forward, uh, our sort of broad approach is that the, 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 the key challenge, and it's alluded to in the report, the key challenge is uh, the development of more social care provision uh, in local communities, uh, because we've got you know a significant problem which is 
identified within the performance reports on a growing number of delayed discharges uh, and the, 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 the underlying uh, problem uh, with, with, with the delayed discharge is the need to develop new, more flexible models of uh, social care support within the community. Uh, so we, we we are, for example, you know, uh, the, on the wider points of the community bed review. Uh, yes, we, we want to have a sharper focus uh, on the role of community hospitals in the future uh, and particularly their role in supporting the rehabilitation uh, of patients who are stepping down from hospital or maybe stepping up from the community. Uh, but our broad approach is uh, to address that, that challenge of delayed discharges. Uh, and we, we aim to develop a more flexible community bed model, which yes, looks at the role of community hospitals, but also at the same time looks about how we can develop more fit for purpose care home provision across Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, the developments of more housing with care and support services. And within the report, I've alluded to that we're making progress on the developments of new extra care services is in Langham in Moffat. Uh, and then the, the other challenge uh, is the developments of more care home provision. Uh, and stepping back a bit, uh, our staff uh, who are now deployed primarily through home teams uh, are support or having to support people in the community uh, because of delays in the capacity of our care or home providers to support people. Uh, so it's the, the you know the, the high level message uh, in terms of the community bed review, and there will be a full engagement which is going to start in, in the new year. Uh, or our underlying position is the need to develop more social care support within local communities. Thanks, Gary. Do you want to come back to Councillor Thompson? Thanks, uh, convener, and thanks for that answer, uh, Gary. I think I think the the, the present uh, concern is really that that sounds good for the long term, but it doesn't really give much comfort for the short term. I think so, and I appreciate there's a lot of pressures across the sector, but. Um, and that within the report, obviously the delayed discharge figures uh, are red. You know, it's, it's high, and I think we know we can see that from the report. Um, so, what, what sort of short-term tactical measures are we taking to address the current issue uh, under the auspices of finding a longer-term solution, as you've outlined with consultations starting next year? Yeah, no, you're quite right. I mean, the the the, the, the long-term position will be set out, and proposals will come. Uh, to the IJB, there will be a draft report yeah, in the middle of next year and the final report is anticipated by next September. But in the short term, there's a number of measures uh, that, that, we're, that we're taking to, to deal with the current uh, crisis, if you like, in terms of access to support in the community. Uh, so one example is that I've got a particular lead role now uh, with other colleagues in the in increasing the capacity of our existing care homes uh, because uh, and quite a large number of people within community hospitals are awaiting a suitable care home placements. Uh, so I am sort of developing a plan to increase capacity uh, within our, our existing care home sector. A number of our care homes uh, have got the potential to provide short-term increase in their bed capacity uh, by experiencing uh, some staffing shortages. Uh, so I'm sort of developing plans uh, to work with a number of uh, local care homes to one, try and immediately, uh, you know, within a matter of weeks and months, increase the number of bed capacity, uh, both in Annandale and Estelle and, and indeed across the uh, the whole of Dumfries and Galloway. We are also exploring uh, with our existing care home providers and to see whether we can attract new providers into Dumfries and Galloway. Because uh, the, 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 what we're aware of is that, uh, that there hasn't been the development of new care homes within Dumfries and Galloway for a number of years. And we need to one, support our existing care home providers and expand their capacity, but at the same time, develop new provision within the area. 
that, that's it in terms of care homes. In terms of care at home, uh, there is a care at home project group that's been established. Uh, and amongst the things that we're doing, uh, we've got a whole range of initiatives uh, in support of care, care at home. And I don't want to underestimate the challenges of care at home because at the moment uh, we all find it difficult as our private providers to actually increase the size of the workforce. Uh, now the short term plan, probably the medium term plan, is to take forward a series of measures uh, so that we can uh, improve uh, the efficiency uh, of our existing capacity about how that's deployed. So one example, uh, and I was attending a meeting yesterday uh, where we've, we are, will be sharing with providers detailed information about one, where we currently provide uh, care at home provision through the uh, providers. Uh, and in many areas, we have more than one provider working in the same geographical area, uh, and that can produce logistical difficulties for care at home providers because we could have, you know, two or three staff working for different organisations supporting people in the same street, and that isn't really the most efficient use of resources. So we're sharing with providers very detailed information. Uh, to try and help them to plan what they call their runs more uh, efficiently. Uh, so I, that, that's been shared with providers this week. Uh, other areas that we're looking at is that we need to prioritise uh, those people in greatest need uh, for care at home provision. Uh, a third area, uh, and this is a difficult uh, area but we, we will be writing to uh, to our existing uh, clients of care or home services to say that moving forward uh, we're asking families to be more flexible about the time of the visit that care or home providers make uh, in the past you know you know we could be specific about you know a care or home worker would support the person at a particular time. Unfortunately, uh, because of severe pressures on the care home sector, uh, we can provide support, but we're asking families to be more flexible and patient so that uh, we will give a window of when, you know, a window of time, you know, hypothetically it could be, you know, seven till nine, uh, when the care home provider will make that morning visit, for example. Uh, that's a difficult one and it will be inconvenient for, for some uh, families, uh, but we would sooner provide a service, you know, within a window rather than, uh, and at the moment we, we just find it difficult to sustain being specific about the time of the visit. Uh, so I don't know whether Caroline wants to add to that really, because I know social work staff are heavily involved in the review of the, the uh, the, the, the review of our care at home service. So, Caroline, I don't know whether there's anything you want to add to that. I think you've probably covered most things, Gary, and I would just add that we're obviously working very closely with our third sector providers as well. So things like hot meal provision and um, those kinds of um, levels of support that we're looking elsewhere rather than our care providers to see if there's alternative ways of providing that support to people um, when, when we're struggling to, to, us, to get that in place. The only the only other thing I would add, sorry, is that and I spoke to my colleague Jimmy Marshall, uh, the, the locality social work manager. He met with uh, providers yesterday as it happens. We have a regular locality forum with providers. Uh, and that, that was a positive meeting, but uh, the feedback which will be fed back to our, our project team is that local providers, particularly care at home providers, uh, are struggling with the escalating costs of energy and fuel, uh, and they are finding it difficult uh, to retain staff, and particularly for staff to use their own vehicles. Uh, that, that's been a problem. A local provider as well as have their rent uh, 
increased threefold over the last year. Uh, so that there are financial pressures on local care or home providers. So it's partly, you know, about terms of conditions of staff, uh, but it's also, you know, within that, it's the escalating cost of fuel for care or home staff. Uh, so we're feeding that back into the project group. There are no easy solutions to it. I think it's fair to say that uh, both care homes and care at home providers, uh, you know, have experienced difficulties over the last 12 months, but it's particularly care at home providers where the pressures are most acute. Uh, thanks, Gary, for your comprehensive report and for your contribution, Caroline. Obviously, uh, local hospitals are very important to our communities in Andy on the SDL, and we hope we've got a really important part and role to play in the future of healthcare in the area. I'm going to bring in Councillor Crothers now. Thank you, Chair. I'll just be very brief in regards to the, the point. It's more, it's more of a something that's come up in the national news, Gary, more well, recently. And we've talked about social prescribing for a number of years now, how that can be effective. But I think it's Gloucestershire and Aberdeen, Stroke Aberdeenshire, has looked at the prospects of, and perhaps maybe they've even implemented, uh, it's paying fuel bill for people with respiratory uh, as, a, as a form of prescribing and uh, arthritis, things like that. So people can keep it warm. In their, own, in their own homes and the benefits they've received from that is uh, stopping bed blocking, better, uh, better lifestyle outcomes really for, for the individuals themselves. So I just wonder, is that something that uh, through the health and social care they've ever looked at, contemplated, thought about in regards to implementing at any time? I think it's through the GPs in particular it came through, uh, Chair. But just to, because of what's happening nationally and obviously the climate around about here, south of Scotland, Scotland in particular, uh, would that be an option going forward? I, I can take that back, Council Carruthers. Uh, what I would say is that uh, across all areas, including the, the one you've just alluded to, we are increasingly uh, forging relationships and learning from best practice in other parts of Scotland. Uh, so, you know, for example, the work we're doing uh, with care of home providers, uh, we're, we're learning from good practice in other parts of Scotland. Uh, and in terms of social prescribing, uh, I, I, I will, I've made a note of your comments and I will feed that back to our uh, home teams uh, to see if, if there's further work we can do on, so, on the, the rollout of social prescribing. Uh, particularly with you know with the support of local GPs, uh, because as we enter the winter, as we all know, uh, you know heating is a major issue, and, uh, you know for 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 well for older people and, and for, for younger people as well. Uh, but I will make a note of those uh, examples you've you've given, uh, Council Crothers, and discuss that further with my colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Just to come back in. So it was just it was a much about a, an update. Have we looked at that, Gary? So it'd be good to see that information if we could come back uh, at some point later in the future. Uh, I'm not advocating it. I'm not for or against it. I'm sitting impartially here, but it sounded very interesting. It did make national news. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll report back on the at the next meeting, if not before. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Councillor Crothers. We'll, no more, uh, no members want to speak, so we'll go to the recommendations. Members are asked to one review and scrutinise the overall summary of performance outlined in, in the appendix. Consider whether uh, to consider whether the actions proposed are adequate to improve performance and future monitoring of areas which have not met the target, and recognise the areas of good practice, high performance, where the target has been exceeded. We have considered that. Do we want to make any comments on on this, or are we happy to 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 uh, accept accept the report? Okay, accept the report. And three, recommend any matters from the appendix back for consideration by the integrity joint board, were considered appropriate. And we're happy to accept accept these three recommendations. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary and Caroline, and we look forward to seeing you again in a few months' time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're on to item five in the agenda, social work services, end of year assessment of business plan 2019 to 2023 performance, 1st of April 2021 to 31st of March 2022.
I've got a report by the Chief Social Work Officer. So this item is a Social Work's end of year assessment of business plan. Members are asked to review the overall summary of performance and to consider area-based successes and developments as detailed in the report. I think you'll agree there's interesting local detail in the Justice Services section of the report outlining the projects that were completed in the Annandale and Estale area recently. It's also interesting to note that work has gone into creating significant garden areas and in cemetery, and it was pleading to read that two service users have since secured employment in construction using the skills learnt during the development. The report highlights increased workload and social work services staff due to increased demand and legislative changes. And it's also commendable read that good practice has been maintained during this difficult period. This has also been highlighted in the areas of children and families with a reduction in staffing levels by 30% seems concerning for officers and members. Rebecca Aldridge is on teams to answer any members' questions or to address any members' comments. Caroline Robertson. Robertson. Right. So Caroline Robertson is on, on the teams to answer any questions. It's over to members now. Would you like to add in to your report, Caroline? No, I don't have anything to add. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Jimison. This is a, a, a general question. Clearly, there's a great deal of pressure on the social service, etc. I'm just wondering how closely you work with the education system through the, the, the teachers, the support teachers in the in schools, who sometimes have to work with families as well, how that can maybe ease the burden or identify issues at an earlier stage, and also connect the work that you're doing with families, with the the, the few hours that the, the young people play, uh, spend in schools. Unfortunately, um, I might not be able to answer all of your question, but I will take it back and, and provide a response. Um, I know that children and families work very closely with education colleagues um, and have, have regular meetings with them in it, and they're really good at highlighting any concerns directly to social work. And I think um, the named person, particularly in schools, they, they have lots of contact with the children. They highlight their concerns to us, but again, manage things very, very well themselves within schools. Um, so, so certainly there is there is good communication and support there between the services. But if there's more detail required, I can certainly take that back and respond. Um, if possible, could you look into that just to see how effective it actually is, how the, the connections are made? Because teachers are busy, social work people are busy. But th there may be ways if, if we in interrogate the current situation that it might be improved because the, there's a lot that can be, young people can come to school unhappy but they might be happier in school and vice versa so the, the more that we can identify closer working relationships and, and possibly a, a, an outlying suggestion possibly is social works uh, resource in schools or helping teachers understand a little bit more about the, the, the work of the social work so that there's a, a greater connection between the two services. Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Chair. Um, no, I welcome this report. I was just sort of wondering, it's, it's hard to know what to recommend back to uh, social work in a sense because I suppose sometimes we're accustomed to seeing um, you know, performance indicators, for example, obviously it's maybe not appropriate in this particular report, but in 3.4.15 on page 29, it talks about um, the impact um, in terms of the investment into services for, for, for various types of things. All, all it really says there is that, and it's welcome, but there's a significant decrease in the number of children in the child protection register, which is good. Um, and obviously that doesn't necessarily mean there's a decrease in the amount of work because a lot of it will be um, interventions, for example, to prevent something escalating to uh, um, more, something more serious. But beyond that, it's very, it's, it's very much a narrative description. So I'm wondering if it would be um, useful to 
uh, for members anyway to just sort of see, well, w what's the percentage change? Obviously, without revealing individual details that might be sensitive, but um, to get a sense of um, the actual quantities involved, if you like, and, and not to depersonalize it, but just to sort of see uh, in a more sort of performance framework base. Um, I don't know if that could be taken on board, if that if that if that's a reasonable request, but um, while the narrative is welcome, it's just hard to get a sense of, well, are, are we doing better than we were, or is this trend improved, or, you know, are, are we, I know it's maybe not wise to set targets, because obviously if people are in need, they're in need, and that's that, but um, uh, just to get a sense of how well we're coping under the extreme pressure that the service is under. Thank you, Chair. Caroline. Yes, thank you. I'm happy to take that back to Lillian and, and request and see if she can provide that detail. That'd be welcome. We'll, we'll take a note of that, Caroline. I don't have anybody else want to speak, so we'll move to the recommendations. Members are asked to one, review the overall summary of performance within the Chief Social Work Officer's business plan in the Arendelle and Estelle area. We, we have reviewed it. Two, consider the additional area-based successes and developments as detailed in the key successes section of this report. We have considered these and they're, they're most welcome. And three, consider any aspects of performance to be referred to the relevant future committee. And we've come up with a couple of ideas from Councillor Jimson and Thompson. So we're happy with all these recommendations. Agreed. All right, thanks very much, Caroline. Could you pass on our thanks to, to, to the, all the staff and social work who have contributed so much over the past years? Thank you, very, thank you very much. I will, thank you. Item six is Communities Director End of Year Assessment of Business Plans 2019 to 2023. Uh, and there's a report by the Director of Communities. Uh, so we've been asked to consider the community's directory, directory end of year performance. I'm pleased that you s to see that this report contains disaggregated information for our area because we always want local information. There are 39 performance measures, only three of which are outside the acceptable limits. And there are 14 measures regarding projects which are all within acceptable limits. It's pleasing to see the amount of detail in this report and the positive impacts on our local communities. I'd like to briefly highlight in particular the work with young people in terms of counselling in schools and impacting on mental health improvement, also the positive feedback from young people engaging the summer of play in 2021. I'd also highlight the positive contribution around visitor return, helping reassure our communities and visitors to our communities post lockdown and helping manage community safety, civic pride and cleanliness as DNG once again welcome visitors back to our region responsibly, obviously, post COVID. I am pleased to see that the new investment is being made in six of our area's play parks, needing it, which need it most, and look forward to seeing the further investment outlined in 3.14.1. And hopefully these will coming to future in fruition in the near future in our area. There's a lot of detail in the report and I've highlighted only a couple of aspects. I'm sure that members will have specific questions they would like to comment. Uh, Richard Greveson is in the room to answer any member's questions or address any member comments. So I'm looking for contributions here. Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was actually just on some of the um, the red blobs in the report, uh, particularly around um, inspections on, uh, uh, well, sort of trading standards effectively. And I just wondered if you could maybe expand a little bit more. Obviously, we want to support local businesses, but we kind of hope they're supporting themselves as well by um, behaving in an appropriate way, et cetera, and, and operating efficiently. But is, it, is that a resourcing issue? And while we welcome investment in play parks, um, is it our trading standards team that maybe needs support in getting around the businesses to make sure we're operating safely as a region? Thank you. Councillor Thompson, uh, through you, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, yeah, I'm happy to provide a wee bit more uh, information, narrative on the, the three areas that, is, that you've highlighted, Councillor Thompson, where the status is below the target for the period. Um, first one, number of farms checked, where we've got 229 against a target of 300 for the period. 
This was adversely affected by the local outbreak of avian influenza, and that impacted on the service from uh, November 21 onwards. Uh, the second point, trusted trader, uh, 175 traders on the scheme against a target of 200. There's an audit of membership of uh, the traders uh, on the scheme every April uh, to ensure that standards are maintained at a high level. Um, and any traders who, who are not meeting the criteria uh, are then removed from the scheme and supported in terms of their, um, uh, the work that they need to do in order to, to re-engage in, in, the, in the process as well. So that's, that's the reason for the drop, um, but I'm pleased to say that uh, from discussion with colleagues, there, there is work ongoing uh, with uh, those traders and indeed others, uh, and we're expecting that to be addressed uh, in, in the very near future in terms of the, the, the numbers against target. And the final area is food inspections. Uh, there was 412 against a target of 516. That was because the Food Standards Scotland required the service to re-risk all of the food businesses at the beginning of 21-22, uh, and therefore they were not able to start their inspection program until September. Um, there was also some, some absence within the service. So again, you're quite right, Councillor Thompson, the service is looking at uh, resources and ensuring there's, there's adequate in there at the moment. But I think in terms of the, the status in those specific areas, there's, there's justified reasons, as, as I've explained, as to why that is, as opposed to being a, a lack of resource at this point. Uh, just, uh, from, a, from the Annan perspective, uh, it mentioned the report about the, about the number of visits to public swim pools, and one feedback I'm getting about the Annan pool is that the public sessions on a Saturday don't begin until after midday, and it's whether that could be looked at and whether you could inform us how they decide the opening hours, because that's one, one, f one feedback I've had from, from local people. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I know from previous work with the leisure and sport team that the, the, the programme in each of the facilities is, is under uh, ongoing review, um, subject to demand and engagement with customers. Happy to take that point back to the senior officer in regard to leisure um, and, and ask for a more detailed res response specific to Annan Swimming Pool in that regard, uh, uh, Chair. Well, happy to do that. Uh, thank you, Richard. Any other questions? Not seeing anything, so we'll go to the recommendations. Members are asked to review the overall summary of performance within the individual head of service bureau plans in the Annandale and Eskill area. Two, consider the additional area-based successes and developments as detailed in key achievements section of this report. And consider, and three, consider any aspects of performance to be referred to the relevant future committee. Are we all happy with these recommendations that we've carried out these tasks? Agreed. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. We're on to the next item, which is item seven, which I don't seem to have, but uh, Seven, right, we've got that. I shall lend the script off behind. <laughs> Seven is Education and Learning Director, end of year assessment uh, and performance from April 2021 to 31st of March 2022. And there is a report by the Director of Skills, Education and Learning. Our performance report is Education and Learning. I note that from the 10 performance indicators, nine now are on track, and only one hasn't been met and is out and which is out with acceptable limits. The one not met is relating to the percentage of pupils gaining five plus awards at level six at Annandale and Estdale. Jim Brown is on teams. Well, it's Alison Chambers is on, on teams. <laughs> and we want to add some further context around this indicator when I come to, come to ask him. There's a good amount of detail within the report and it is interesting to understand the level of attendance and exclusion within our schools in, in Annandale and Estdale. I'm also sure all members would like to congratulate Butick Primary School for achieving their gold UNICEF right respecting schools award, Breikert Primary School for achieving silver status, and wish Gretna Primary School well in their endeavor to achieve silver, sta silver status. 
Alison Chambers, you changed one of these, but not the, not the, not the first one. <laughs> Alison Chambers is on Teams to answer any members' questions or address any member comments. Alison, I wonder if you could ask you to provide some more for the contracts or in the performance indicator mentioned earlier about attainment that hasn't been met and is out with uh, acceptable limits. Thank you, Vice Chair, and apologies for our late arrival to the meeting this morning. We had the wrong link, so we have come in just in time. So I'm delighted to be with you this morning, and I will be representing Jim Brown. So the exception report, as you mentioned, was an indicator regarding the pupils gaining five plus awards at um, level six. And so therefore, what I would say to that point is that that was during uh, the um, alternative exam certification model. And so therefore, it's a bit like apples and pears. We can't really compare and contrast just as we perhaps would have done. Um, however, we have got um, the target, although it's without exception, this was mainly because of COVID and alternative certification model. Uh, open up to members, Councillor Thompson. Thanks again, Chair. Uh, it was just on um, 3.7 on developing the young workforce uh, within the report, um, and it talks about um, uh, dedicated staff being sort of embedded, if you like, in the four uh, secondary schools in Andale and Estill, um, and also how part of the work is to uh, develop a picture, if you like, of um, you know where there may be gaps or opportunities are within the sort of wider uh, cohort, etc., and then presumably how to address that and develop it towards positive and sustained destinations for the young people and students. So, um, w when will we get to see the picture? I suppose is the question, and also um, how will we then be able to, you know, I suppose that that should inform us how we can measure the impact of that work that's going on uh, in terms of sustaining that and sort of seeing an improvement, if you like. So is there anything further you can add to that and just in terms of when we might be able to see that? Thank you. Good morning, Councillor Thompson. So in terms of your question there, it is about we do have our DYW coordinators and they link with Skills Development Scotland. And so therefore they're working in partnership to ensure that there's then that information that's travelling both ways. There is a report due um, just after February and there's current work happening at the moment to pull all that data together. So there is data, but it's not it's still embargoed to a point because it still has to go through all the checks and balances. So therefore, there is data to ensure that we are looking at the information that's coming in, we are looking at where the gaps are and then meeting those gaps and having those conversations. Uh, thanks for that. Um, and I appreciate, obviously, there's information will come to us in, in, in the fullness of time. Um, and interesting to hear the involvement of Skills Development Scotland too. I think, I think there's a bit of a national look at how they fit into the wider picture as well so that's probably welcome too uh, just on another point it was about um 3.83 in the report to do with the uh, exclusion rate which i think in anadale and Estill we're actually doing um well in this regard in terms of um trying to have a more better relationships and inclusive ap approach so i was just sort of wondering what is it we're doing here because it's something we should s celebrate it's maybe the wrong word but i think we should recognize anyway um, what is it we're doing here that the rest of the region isn't doing as successfully and, and could other parts of the Dumfries and Galloway learn from us? Thank you. A leading question. Thank Nelson. you. Sorry? Leading question. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's my first time here as well, so I thought you were going to go gentle, not to worry. So in terms of that, um, looking at best practice and sharing that best practice, we are trying to move all schools, all schools towards a better relationships, better learning policy and so therefore it may well be that Annie Dale and Estelle are the front are in the front foot of this and I absolutely would suggest that we are sharing that practice across the wider authority. Uh, Councillor Jimison. Yeah, just as a follow up and not a duplication of, of what uh, Stephen has just covered, the increase in the numbers of from developing the young workforce is an, it's a, it's a really big investment, one for, for, for each school. Recent report uh, and a commission that I'm involved with on learning is that 50% of careers advice, this is feedback from young people, 50% of careers advice comes from teachers and less than 10% from the likes of SDS and developing the young workforce. So just to add to, to Stephen's query, I, I would be really interested in the outcomes of developing the young workforce, skills development Scotland, and how much influence we as, 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 a, as a council can have on them because from my own experience of DYW and SDS, sometimes 
especially well, developing the young workforce is driven by a local board and it much a lot of the the guidance and the drive is delivered from that local board which sometimes can be heavily weighted towards certain industries so um, what I'm really asking for is we'll have a review of how effective that is for young people because if the young people don't get the guidance at school as early as in S1, S2, probably even earlier, they've got subject choices which will affect their career options and also their further education options. So if they're not getting that guidance, and I've been talking to a lot of young people, and it's, it's more than anecdotal because it's quite overwhelming, the proportion of young people that don't think they've received the best or enough guidance on subject choice. Uh, further education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think it's really important because it's a lot of money going into it. How effective is it for for the young people? Um, it affects positive destinations as well. So th I would like to ask about positive destinations. This is the first destination when they leave school. We could do with a bit of nuance in that, in my opinion. Is it just a tick in the box that this young person has found a job or he's in a course? How long has he lasted in that course? Is that job something that it's a positive destination, could they have done better? So rather than just the numbers, it would be really useful if we had some more nuanced information to feed back to schools and young people and parents. Because I'm not in any way minimizing the efforts that have been put into it. And I'm not minimizing the lack of time that people have got. But we need to fine tune this so that we're actually delivering career subject choices. My last question, particular to Annandale and Estdale, do we have the breadth and depth of curriculum options that's equivalent, not just to the rest of the Fish and Galloway, but to, to the Central Belt, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and if not, how can, how can we improve that? Because the, uh, the four secondary schools in the, in the Annandale and Estdale are a wee bit further away, for example, than the Dumfries schools. So how do we offer the same outcomes, outputs, in Annandale and Estdale as perhaps they're getting in other areas of regions. I know that's a lot of questions, but they're all sort of interlinked to Stephen's. <coughs> no, thank you, Councillor Jameson. And if I pick up on the first point that you raised about the school leavers destination, particularly that in initial destination, and then moving on to that sustained destination, I think that's where you're looking for a bit more information around the detail in terms of Annandale and Estdale. And I don't have that information with me today, but certainly that is information that is gathered. And certainly I can take that back to my colleagues to come back to you at a further meeting. In terms of the, the careers information that's shared within schools, again, I would say that programmes are set within every school within Annandale and Estdale, and of course across the Priest and Galloway. But always requiring fine tuning and so therefore I would say that we do work with our partners at SDS as well as DYW to use the data that we have within those hubs and then bring that into the school to try and inform young people and their parents and this week there is a careers um, information session for parents that's going to be driven by DYW so it is an ongoing process and we're always fine tuning to try and ensure that we get the, the right information to the right people at the right time. In terms of that breadth and depth of your curriculum offer and how we're using that data to be data informed and data rich to ensure we've got that breadth and depth, what we have been doing again is looking at that curriculum offer and there's current work going on about what we currently offer and what we could possibly potentially offer in the future and that's been looked at um, not just within Annandale and Estale, but in that wider scope of Dumfries and Galloway. Um, so in terms of that offer, it will be looking at what do young people want to, to do, what careers are, are out there, working with the board, the DYW board, to ensure that we're actually making those links. So therefore, again, it's work in progress, uh, but absolutely it's about using the information we have from all our different sources to try and inform, to support young people to make those sustained positive destinations so they're part of our local communities. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alison. Any more questions? One more from George. Sorry, but this is my pet subject. <laughs> the performance in primary schools in, in writing, numeracy, etc., is, is clearly taking a dip, and I'm, I'm fully aware of the, the impact that the pandemic had on that. Um, but it's obviously something of, of concern. A linked question is the, the, the use of uh, PEF and also ESL funding. How much ESL funding is subsidised by PEF and do, when I speak to head teachers, 
they're using a, a lot of their PEF on ESL for catch-up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would like to think it's additional rather than supplementary. Sorry, <laughs> supplementary rather than uh, patching up the, the, the holes. So I, I'm really interested in how, how, it's particularly in primary schools, but also in secondary schools. How is there enough resource going into ESL with regards to catching up and also helping the academic kids that are having problems? Um, and is PEF somehow? Uh, shielding some of the, 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 the funding or supporting the funding. Um, I think this also links with the UNCRC and GERFEC, and it's a huge challenge, but, but it's, it is a big risk for the, the Education Authority that we're not uh, achieving what we should be achieving under UNCRC uh, and GERFEC, and obviously part of that is PEF and ESL uh, at, at certain stages. So again, it's a broad question, but it's it's a question about resources, how best we use the resources and, and the benefit of that going throughout the, 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 the school, given 30 odd percent of, of young children now are designated ESL and probably more of them could, could do with some support. So first, my first question is, is the pandemic the main reason for the poor performance in primary schools and literacy and numeracy? And secondly, how can we maximize the resources that we have under ESL and PEF to benefit children that are, that are in need of additional support. Thank you, Councillor Jameson. And I'm not going to try and give you a full answer because I don't truly really know the answer to, your, all, to all your questions. What I can say is I can go away and find out that information and bring that back to yourself. In terms of has the, the drop in literacy and numeracy been partly to do with the, the pandemic, I think anecdotally we would say yes, that has been the case uh, because young people weren't in schools for long periods of time. In terms of how we're using that PEF, we know that PEF money was um, put in place for supporting young people to close that attainment gap in terms of the literacy and numeracy. And there's been many interventions across our primary schools uh, to, to, to try and to close that gap. In terms of has it been a top up in, in, um, for ESL, uh, that, that's something that I cannot answer to today because I don't know the answer to that. So therefore I will need to come back to you on that. Thank you. Okay, th thanks, Alison. I don't have anybody else waiting to ask questions, so we'll move to the recommendations. Uh, members are asked to consider the Education and Learning Director area-based successes and developments as detailed in the key successes section of this report. We'll consider that. To scrutinize the area report, Arndale and Estill has set out Appendix 1. We'll scrutinize that. And 3, review the attainment summary, Arndale and Estill 2021 as set out in Appendix 2. We've reviewed that. And four, consider any aspects of performance to be referred to the relevant future committee. So we're happen to, happy to, to go with the recommendations and we'll get more information back from Alison and we'll you can share it all with all, all, all members, please, Alison. And thank you very much for your, for your contribution today. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to item nine now because uh, we're waiting for who are we waiting for can you? Uh, colleagues from economy waiting for co colleagues from economy and resources uh, to come in. So we're on now to item nine and the Nest area committee tackling poverty and inequalities funding. Uh, could I ask members to first consider the two recommendations two point one and two point two. And when we get those agreed, we will move to consider the scoring panel's recommendation as set out in Table 1 and Appendix 2. Members, can we agree to recommendation 2.1, the total funding for distribution of £29,767.94p. Can we ag agree that? No dissent, so we'll, we'll uh, agree that. And moving to recommendation 2.2, note that Andale and SDL Area Committee tackling poverty and inequalities funds priorities eligibility cri criteria contained in Appendix 1. So if you just check that you're happy with, with Appendix 1, we'll just give you a few seconds to, to, to 
we familiarise with them, and if you're happy, can we agree that can we agree that can we agree that those eligible eligibility act and criteria can be in the name, but uh, appendix one, we're happy with that. Okay, agreed. Uh, thanks, members. So, turning to the scoring panel's recommendations, as set on table one, there were 14 applications submitted, and these are summarised in Appendix 2, along with the scoring panel recommendations and comments. I would point out that the awards are recommended by the scoring panel, and it is at the discretion of members to agree these awards. awards sorry. Members should be aware that we have discretion around how much is awarded. We have no discretion around the total amount at our disposal, i.e. if we change the amounts allocated, we've got a limit on how much we can spend. The total needs have to remain the same. Therefore, a change of allocation to one group implies a change, a change of allocation to another. Any proposed change of allocation should also be accompanied by a rationale from members. Uh, how would the members like to proceed? Uh, I think I would like to... Uh, to go in block with this, but if, it, if there's particular things that you want to raise, then I think you, you, have, you can raise, raise them now. Uh, Stuart, Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think, first of all, if I could maybe ask, in Table 1, okay, so on page 84 and 85, it sets out the, the summary and the scores and the recommended awards, etc. Uh, I'm conscious that um, the highest score is 75, and I'm wondering if this is the um, the scoring from all the applications that have come in against a criteria that we've set to be relevant to Annandale and Estill, and the highest score is 75. Have we got our criteria right, and are we promoting it properly? So it's may maybe a general question about that, because if we've got our framing correct, we'd probably expect to have identified the type of need in the area and the groups that might come forward and we'd probably expect to see higher scores. I mean, that's maybe just an, in, an instinct rather than a, a, a proper reflection, but is there maybe something that we can maybe get a wee bit more understanding about that? Because maybe we've missed the mark a wee bit. It's just to get a sense of that. Thanks, Chair, through yourself. I'll pass that to Stuart. Yep. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, in terms of the promotion of um, the Tackle on Poverty and Inequalities Fund, I think there was broad um, promotion of this fund um, and general um, Sort of uptake and interest, um, particularly through third sector of Decent Gallery and uh, colleagues across the ward working sort of structure in Annandale and Estill. Um, the scoring framework uh, that the scoring panel that make the assessment uh, covers, there's eight different areas that are covered. It is a very challenging um, scoring process to, to get through. And whilst, um, and, I can, I, and I can cover the elements that are, that are, that are within that scoring framework, um, there's a key element which is evidence of match funding and the elected members are very keen that projects that, that are supported through this fund um, demonstrate some element of match funding and there is a, a waiting associated with that. Um, therefore, it, it, it is very challenging, I suppose, to get the, the, the full match of 100% um, unless you are, you've, you've got a substantial amount of match funding and, and are hitting all of the, the targets associated with the, the community planning um, partnership tackle and poverty objectives and also um, our local area committee priorities. Um, so, and I can briefly kind of run through the areas um, to assist you, if you like, in terms of the assessment that's undertaken. So there's a, a, a calculation in terms of the evidence of match funding, which produces a score. Um, we assess whether there's an application fits with the community plan and partnerships, tackling poverty and inequality strategy objectives. Um, the, the area committee's uh, priorities for this budget um, whether the application benefits those experiencing po poverty and or inequalities within Annandale and Estill. Um, there needs to be evidence of impact and evidence of need, evidence of sustainability and evidence of community involvement uh, in the development and delivery of the project. Um, so there is, there's a whole, there's a, a real, what I'm trying to say I suppose is there's a broad uh, assessment across a number of different areas uh, and there is, we do try and support um, organisations as much as we can to ensure that they are um, application addresses these areas and the, the certainly the application form that is uh, published and applicants complete um, directly asks questions associated with the score with those um, areas so they, they are prompted through the process to to complete um, and provide some evidence that we can we can assess 
Yeah, it's something that we could obviously look at annually and see what the criteria is in there. Uh, obviously, there's no perfect system, and people would like to award people a lot more money, but the money's just just not there. Is there any any particular things, or do we go to the rec or do we go to the recommendations as set out uh, at by the by the officers in their in their uh, assessment of the eligible eligibility and criteria. Okay. So we're going on to the, the recommendations. One, two point one. Note the tackling poverty and inequalities budget available. We've done these two already, so we'll go to two point three. Consider the scoring panel's recommendations as set out in Appendix 2 and detailed in paragraphs 3.5 to 3.13 and agree the awards as appropriate, and we're saying as recommended. And 2.4, subject to decision 2.3, agree how to utilize the, the remaining budget. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so just, I mean, could, could I suggest then that we do um, agree at 2.3, if that's okay? And then what? We're do happy that we agree 2.3. Yeah. Yep. And 2.4, we've got to, we've got to consider. So I'm just sort of wondering, um, what does that leave again, uh, and uh, and what are our options? Thanks. Uh, as members have fully committed the budget in terms of the recommendations, the the, the final recommendation, I suppose. Um, there's no requirement for us to adopt that. Um, had members uh, amended the, the awards that were uh, recommended and which had subsequently led to remaining funding, then members may have been inclined to perhaps either reopen the fund um, or utilise it for other purposes. But if you have agreed at 2.3 to the recommendations at table so one, there's, two, there's no two budget. Point four is superfluous. Uh, 2.4 is superfluous, so. C can I just then? Through yourself, Chair, congratulate um, the officers and the applicants for making exactly the right applications to use exactly the budget that was allocated. Thank you. Just a coincidence, <laughs> just, just a coincidence, perhaps. But let's see. Thanks for for that. We we agreed all the recommendations there, and we're on to ten road work management, street naming, development at Alton Mott. Uh, you'll correct me in that pronunciation, uh, the local members. Well, Road Moffat, report by interim head of roads and infrastructure. So, our final report for today is associated with the street name of development Alton Mott in Moffat. The post names are, I think this, uh, the names, the names uh, don't, com don't, the spelling doesn't uh, agree with the spellings on the map. So, I'm thinking it's. If it's like Alan, it's the Mott, not not the Moat. Uh, through yourself, Chair, thank you. Yes, so um, I think Moat refers to something you remove from your eye before you remove it from other people's, if you're getting biblical. But um, I think Moat is uh, M-O-T-T-E, and I think that's what it is in the map. So as long as we don't agree to call it the wrong thing, but Moat, as, as per the map, I think reflects the actual local existing uh, known street um, and locations. Thank you. So Mott Road and Mott Avenue are the recommendations. Chris Coulter is on Teams. Thank you, Chair. Charis, sorry, is on Teams to answer. All right. Thank you, Chair. I don't have anything to add to my report, so if anyone has any questions yet. So, if members, what's your thoughts? W notwithstanding the, the spelling error uh, with moat, but if it could be M-O-T-T-E, then I'm happy with that. And I think uh, ward members were consulted and were largely supportive. Thank you. And you, are you sure about this pronunciation? Is it moat or moat? Not that it matters, because it's, well, it does matter, I suppose. I, sp I suppose as the way it's written down means it's up to whoever reads it to pronounce it however they like, Chair, I think. But M-O-T-T-E, um, I think is the correct spelling. Thank you. And then we've got a Mott and Bailey. Yeah. We're happy to agree the recommendations as in the papers. Okay. Okay. 
So we're going to go back to item eight. I thought we'd finished, but we've got to go back to item eight. And uh, we don't have any we don't have any members from Economic Resources as they're involved in a meeting at the bridge. Is that correct? Yeah. And but we will take comments from members on the Economic Resources end of year assessment, and uh, we'll feed it back to them and get any answers to you, to your questions. On item eight, the report mentions that a great deal of the capacity of economic redevelopment staff was taken up with important disbursement of business support grant funds during, po during and post COVID. Specifically, I would like to highlight the local detail in the report around Annan Harbour. A great deal of work has gone in both by Annan Harbour Action Group and Council officers over the last couple of years, which should, which, which uh, should be commended. Emotionally, it was included in a short list of potential investment targets including a, a bid to the UK levelling up fund which were which were an announcement that was that was due last week but it's still not still not uh, been announced whether that bid has been successful there's also a good amount of detail within the report regarding our local housing strategy it's been a good period for our area seeing hundreds of affordable homes being built or are in the planning stage it's also great to see the SDL Foundation recognised the development of the old Langham Police Station, which has been turned into affordable housing. This is a great example of our council supporting community empowerment through community asset transfer and community-led regeneration. So now it's your turn, members. Could you have any questions or comments on it which we can take forward? And we've got Ian, Ian Councillor Ian. Thanks. So just briefly, in regards to no officer being here to to speak to this report, is that what's really happening today? And what is this meeting that they're at the panel actually make this meeting? Uh, I'm happy to get a, a member of that team to respond to members of Anvil and SDL area committee advising of the meeting that they're at and providing that reason, Councillor Crothers. Yeah, obviously, Councillor Crowers, it's not really acceptable that, I met, that uh, officers aren't present. This is, a, this is an important meeting of the Council and we sh it should be attended by officers. Thanks for taking that on board, Chair. I'll leave it in your capable hands of dealing with this. Thanks, Ian. Councillor Jimison. Yeah, referring to page 78, 3.4.3. It's a bit vague, this um, delivery of work streams within the economic recovery plan have continued with good progress and rollout of kickstart. I would really like some more information on that because generally speaking, kickstart was very much a damp squib for, for a lot of the, the outcomes that was desired from kickstart. It, it, again, it was a lot of government money. So I just like to understand how how we can back up that statement that we made progress on, on kickstart. Was that just within the council or was it within the wider sectors? I'm interested in this is because it was complicated. It was very complicated for individual employers to maximize the potential of kickstart. So it dissuaded a lot of people. I know Dan Fish and Galley made a great deal of effort, especially in the economies and resources people within the, the, the council, but I'm interested to see how effectively that was for Dumfries and Galloway, not just for the council, but for employers and, and people within the, the community. Uh, I've not been cheeky here, but good progress on the rollout doesn't tell me very much at all. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Jimison. Uh, we'll take that forward. Obviously, I've experience of kickstart, and sometimes it's been difficult dealing with the uh, employment agencies as well yeah. and, get, and getting money back. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just uh, a couple of things. One um, is to do with the Lockery uh, Wellbeing Centre, which it uh, refers to in the report as getting awarded 774k, I think, at ENR Committee in November uh, earlier this month. Um, so, uh, and it was also, I think, resubmitted for a regional capital grant fund as well. I, I'm just wondering if members could receive a bit more detail on that because. I remember that paper at ENR, and I, didn't, I don't think it specified a figure of that amount in terms of an award. So it was really just to get clarity about the funding package. Obviously, it's something that I'm keen to support, and I think ward members have, have seen the progress of that development. 
over the years, which is positive. Um, but it was just to get a clearer picture of the um, the funding support that we are providing and that we're still hoping to re receive from um, the the national pot in terms of regional, because it's in the next phase of, or it's in the next round of funding applications, I think, so it's just to get an outcome on that. And the other thing was just about, um, uh, I was fortunate to be able to attend the um, the new housing scheme that was opened in Annan, uh, and it was just, uh, obviously it's a wee bit retrospective now, because it's mentioned in the report, but it's now happened, I think you were there yourself, Vice Chair. Um, so it was good to see such a positive development that included a lot of uh, um, renewable energy uh, installations and also active travel links to the local school and services, which um, I think the modern design and layout is a lot different from maybe the housing schemes we maybe knew when we were younger and possibly grew up in. Uh, and a lot more care has been taken to the wider environment to make a sort of more um, homely place for residents. Um, so it was just to welcome that uh, development. Thank you, Vice Chair. Yeah, so certainly the new developments at Elm, Elm Road and Hall Meadow are a big improvement on, on previous housing schemes within Annan uh, and hopefully they will continue in the other areas we're cutting and we're building. But Councillor McGregor on the, online, good morning, Gail. Good morning, Chair. Um, just following on from Councillor Carruthers' point, I don't know that we can really discuss this paper today and, and wonder if we should defer it because it's very specifically asking us to consider any aspects of performance to be referred to a relevant future committee. And without officers here to answer questions on Kickstart or Lockerbie Wellbeing Centre, I, I don't know that we can actually agree the recommendations as read. Um, so maybe looking for a bit of governance advice on that. And just picking up on Councillor Thompson's point, I'm aware that the, the bid did go to the SOSI board recently, so we do need an update on that. Um, and how it's progressing through the RCGF. Um, but we don't have officers here today to answer that, so I don't know whether I need to refer it back to another committee. So I say just a bit of governance advice would be helpful. Okay, we'll get governance advice in a second. Obviously, we concur with you. Uh, I think we will have to ask them, the, them to come back to our, our next meeting as well to speak, but we'll bring in Tracy. Sorry, Tracy's microphone isn't working through for me. It, it wasn't earlier on either when you did the sederant. Oh, apologies, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Sorry, I was just saying it was, uh, within members' gift if they feel they've not got enough information in front of them to defer an item. The next meeting, not till March, um, the chair could uh, agree to call a one-item agenda to deal with this um, and we could try and fit it in prior to the, the Christmas uh, holiday break. Um, to get it dealt with. Obviously, it's the performance up to the 31st of March, so uh, whether members would want to delay it to March 2023, it's, uh, it's a wee bit of time to go and get in um, the updates that you've requested today, but it's uh, clearly up to members. Uh, th thanks, Tracy. I think March is too long to get them, so maybe we could set up a, a Teams meeting in, as soon as possible with the Economy and Resources team. Is that, is that every member agree with that, that we get a team meeting set up? I think that would be helpful because it, I mean, it isn't. It, it's an important report that um, impacts on the local economy. So yes, I, I think that would be a good idea. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, to <coughs> support that. And um, it, however, the right way to do it is if we call it as a, a one item only teams only meeting of the area committee. As yeah, obviously, yeah. it's an, an adjournment or just a fresh meeting. Uh, we would just call a, a special meeting to deal with that one item, Chair. Um, but if members are happy that we specify it will be teams only, then we should probably get it arranged quicker without having to book venues and things. Um, but we can still live stream even though it will be on teams only. George? Yeah, just a wee added uh, piece of information or clarification. I would like kickstart at, at an end date, and my understanding is that it, it, it that has passed some months ago, unless there's been an extension, it was a Westminster fund. Um, no one gets left behind, it, it's a Scottish initiative. Uh, so these sort of things we could do with a fairly urgent um, response so that we know how, how that is being delivered for, 
for young people and career changers, things like that. Um, so I may stand to be corrected here, but I think Kickstart had an end date on it and it could be finished already. And is there a follow-up from Kickstart? Yeah, uh, I think Kickstart has finished. So uh, we've got a note of the we've got a note of the points that have been raised, but we, so we can put them immediately to the team for an answer, uh, and uh, hopefully get them before our teams meet them because it might be a, a week or two before before we get that. So we're happy that we set up a teams meeting, and Stuart will send off the the issues which have been raised, so we can get full answers as soon as possible. Okay. So the recommendations are to, uh, is to adjourn, the, adjourn or call a special meeting by teams with, with the economy and resources and, uh, and seek, seek, seek as answers to the questions that have been raised already as soon as possible. So that, have you got the note of that? Yeah, thanks, Chair. For the sake of the meeting, we'll, we'll mark the recommendation as deferred consideration of this item for a special meeting to be arranged to allow officers to be present. Everybody happy with that one? Yeah, happy. Okay, so uh, we're, go we're on 11. Any other business deemed urgent by the Chairman due to the need for decisions? I have no other business, and thank you all for your forbearance, especially on that last item discussed, and uh, have, a, have a good rest of the week. Thank you very much.